from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Center for the Book. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Library Center for the Book, which is the reading promotion arm of the Library of Congress. Uh, we promote reading in all of the states through a network of state centers for the book. Uh, we also are involved in some other wonderful activities through the Library of Congress, one being the National Book Festival. Uh, this will be our 10th anniversary at the National Book Festival. This year it will be on the Mall on September the 25th. And I hope that many of you will keep track of us or look us up on the website. But best of all, come to the book National Book Festival. It will be a, a wonderful day. Uh, our latest uh, experiment in reading promotion here at the Library of Congress is the opening of a Young Readers Center, the first such animal at the Library of Congress, the one place where we kids under 16 are quite welcome as long as they have an adult with them. And this is an experiment, uh, not really an experiment, it's a new part of the Library of Congress's uh, outreach. And we're pleased to also have a first Center for the Book foothold uh, in the James, excuse me, the Thomas Jefferson Building. We love these Books and Beyond talks, though, in particular, because they are books by, and, by authors who have a special connection one way or another with the Library of Congress. Many of our speakers have used the collections of the Library of Congress. Others are involved with projects uh, with not just the Center for the Book, but maybe from other parts of the library. Uh, and it's an important way that we feel that we can demonstrate a product coming out of all of this book promotion. And we try to give books and authors as much publicity as we can uh, here at the Library of Congress, uh, but also in the States. Uh, the format today is going to be a presentation by our author. Uh, we are being filmed today not only by the Library of Congress for the library's website, but also by C-SPAN and also by the National Journal. So we are part of an educational experience about books uh, of which we are very proud. Uh, one warning, though, is please turn off all things electronic because of the filming that's going on. We will have a brief question and answer period uh, before the book signing. Uh, and at that time, uh, we hope that you have questions. Uh, but your question uh, is your authorizing us to have you participate on film with us uh, as part of the educational experience. There is a new feature for the Library of Congress Center for the Book, a couple of things. We are the administrators or the overseers of a new website, www.read.gov. And secondly, we have a Books and Beyond uh, Facebook club. And there's information about that Facebook club and about our future events on the table here to the side. So please look at that. and. Uh, look for our, our next events. We have several of these Books and Beyond talks, uh, almost one almost every week now for the next uh, couple of months. Catherine Alamong Jacob, hereafter known as Kathy, grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania as part of a family that loved history. After graduating from Goucher College, she earned her MA in history from Georgetown University and her PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University. She has held positions as university archivist at Johns Hopkins, assistant historian at the US, historical, US Senate Historical Office, and as an archivist at the National Archives. Kathy currently is curator of manuscripts at the Schlesinger Library at the, excuse me, at the Schlesinger Library at the History of Women in America on the history of women, I better try that again, the Schlesinger Library on the History of Women in America at the Ratcliffe Institute at Harvard University. Uh, King of the Lobby, today's talk, this is the book. King of the Lobby, which we will hear about today, was most recently published to excellent reviews by Johns Hopkins University Press. It is Kathy's third and her third Washington, D.C.-based centered book. Her first, and I'm the director of the Center for the Book, so I love to introduce through books, 
And this is a book off my own shelves that I've had for a number of years. Her first book, Capital Elites, High Society in Washington, D.C. After the Civil War, was published in 1995 by the Smithsonian Institution Press when she was assistant program director for the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. Her second book, are you ready for this? Testament to Union, Civil War Monuments in Washington, D.C., appeared in 1998, published by Johns Hopkins University Press when she was the deputy director of the American Jewish Historical Society. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Kathy Jacob, who in turn will introduce all of us to the most influential man about Washington in the Gilded Age. Kathy? Thank you, John. Thanks very much for coming. So lamentations that special interests by spending obscene amounts of money were strangling the voice of the people. Fears that the nation was going to hell in a handbasket carried by lobbyists. These worries sound familiar today, but the same stories filled the press and the Capitol building in the 1870s. In the Gilded Age, when wave after wave of scandal uncovered congressmen who sold their votes and ruthless men like Samuel Colt and Collis Huntington who arrived in Washington with boxes of pistols and trunks full of cash with which to buy them, a suave New Yorker, Sam Ward, reigned unspotted as the king of the lobby. Not only that, he transformed what it meant to lobby. Bribes of railroad stock weren't for him. The king of the lobby traded in information exchanged at dinner parties. Evenings that one guest gushed were the climax of civilization. <laughs> at his table, the outlines of a new modern lobby, a lobby easily recognized today, took shape. King of the lobby is about lobbying, power, politics, and money in Washington in the Gilded Age. It's also about delicious food, fine wine, good conversation, and how charming and disarming Sam Ward combined all three to create a new type of lobbying, social lobbying, and he reigned as its king for a decade. Scion of an honorable old family, brother of unassailably upright Julia Ward Howe, best friend of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, mathematician, linguist, California 49er, a spendthrift who squandered several fortunes, Sam Ward was one of the most amazing men of an era crowded with larger-than-life personalities. Sam Ward's story and that of the lobby would be impossible tales to tell with any depth or color or accuracy without the manuscript collections here at the Library of Congress. I'm very grateful to the staff of the Manuscript Division and of the Prints and Photographs Division. The papers of some of Sam's good friends are here. James A. Garfield, Thomas A. Bayard, William M. Evarts, and so are the papers of James G. Blaine, Benjamin Bristow, Salmon Chase, Hamilton Fish, Benjamin Brown French, Manton Marble, Benjamin Butler, who was Sam's nemesis, and many others. And together they provide a richness of detail that's helped me bring Sam Ward back to life. So here's the story of Sam Ward in a nutshell, and pecans were his favorite. <laughs> Sam's early years gave no hint of his future profession. He was born in 1814, the first of six children, into an old New York family. His father, Samuel Ward, was a highly respected conservative banker with the rock-solid firm of Prime, Ward, and King. And Sam Ward, the son, was expected to someday take his place there. When Sam's mother died when he was just 10, his father was devastated and turned to religion. He gave up cigars, he took up temperance, and to the horror of his friends, destroyed all of the wine in his well-stocked cellar. He also became morbidly obsessed with his children's moral, spiritual, and physical health, and tried to shelter them from the world. This handsome house that you can see on the screen was on the corner of Broadway and Bond in Manhattan, and it's the house in which Sam grew up. This image is from the New York Historical Society. It wasn't until Sam was a student at Columbia with both freedom and an allowance that he began to learn about the wider world. He claimed that he and his friends explored every oyster cellar and chop house in Manhattan. His favorite spot was a new little cafe on William Street run by the Swiss brothers John and Peter Delmonico. 
The more he learned of the world, the less Sam wanted to be a banker. He somehow convinced his father to let him go to Europe to study before taking his place at Prime Warden King. And by mid-1832, he was happily settled in Paris, which he called in his first letter home, the, sin, the city of sin and science. I'm sure his father was thrilled. <laughs> Instead of studying at the Sorbonne, Sam threw himself into Parisian society. Charming, handsome, well-dressed, well-mannered, he graced every drawing room he entered. He dined at something new to an American, a real restaurant with tablecloths and individual menus. He developed a taste for subtle sauces and exotic vegetables like eggplant. He spent a staggering amount of money. He literally dined out for decades on stories of the men and women and the new experiences he joined during these years. And this is a stunning picture of Sam. It's still owned by a family member. It was painted in Dresden in 1836 when he was 22. Sam managed to stretch the original year in Paris into three more in Germany, during which he did earn a PhD in mathematics, and he met Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a young widower preparing to take up a post at Harvard. He beca they became best friends, a friendship that lasted for nearly 50 years. When Banker Ward finally ordered Sam home, just as he had feared, Sam came back bursting with new music, dances, books, all the frippery of which the elder Ward had a horror. It was Sam's new ideas, however, which would infuse the rest of his life, and they clashed most sharply with his father's. Julia Ward Howe recalled one debate between the two shortly after Sam came home. Sir, said my brother, you do not keep in view the importance of the social tie. The social what, asked my father? The social tie, sir. I take small account of that, said the elder gentleman. I will die in defense of it, impetuously rejoined the younger. My father was so much amused by this sally that he spoke of it to an intimate friend. Imagine he will die in defense of the social tie indeed. Despite his groanings to letters in letters to friends, Sam did not spend all of his time at Prime Warden King. He renewed his acquaintance with Delmonico's brothers, and as the cosmopolitan oldest son of a rich man, he was invited to every fashionable soiree. At one, Sam met Emily Astor, granddaughter of gouty John Jacob Astor, the richest man in America. They were married in January 1838, and the months that followed were some of Sam's happiest. His father eased up on his hectoring. He had a wife he adored and who adored him. And in November, their first child, a little girl, was born. This painting by Anne Hall, also still in family hands, shows Sam and Emily on their wedding day. The first dark cloud was Samuel Ward's unexpected death in November 1839. Ready or not, Sam moved up the ladder at Prime Ward and King. Next, his brother Henry, who actually understood the banking business and on whom Sam relied, caught typhoid fever, fever and died in Julia's arms. Then came the hideous death of Nathaniel Prime, the retired founder of the bank. Sam wrote to Longfellow, old Mr. Prime committed suicide yesterday by slitting his throat with a razor. There was a bright spot. In mid-February February 1841, Sam dashed off a joyous note to Longfellow announcing the arrival of his first son. Two days later, another note, this time barely legible, brought news of an infection that had set in and Emily had died. And two days after that, Sam's son died too. Sam was executor of his father's several million dollar estate, partner now at one of New York's most prestigious banking firms, guardian of his three high-spirited sisters, a widower, father of a two-year-old little girl, and 27 years old. Widower Sam was also one of the best catches in New York, and two years later he was caught by a beautiful young woman from New Orleans named Medora Grimes. Her mother was a fortune-hunting shrew who had brought her two spoiled daughters to New York to find rich husbands. No one but Sam and Suzette Grimes believed Medora was the woman for him. Longfellow was impressed by her beauty, but by little else, and he told Sam so. This is Medora in an 1852 book, The Book of Home Beauty. Deaf to all caution, Sam married Medora in September 1843. When Medora bore two sons in quick succession, Sam was ecstatic. His home life was happy again, but his business life was anything but. Urged on by Medora, Sam wanted nothing more than to make a lot of money and retire from business. Speculation, he was certain, was his ticket to fortune. In September 1847, Wall Street was stunned by the news that Prime Ward and Company, 
worried about Sam's recklessness, King had withdrawn, had collapsed. Several million dollars were gone and thousands more were owed to creditors. Broke, Sam had to rent his house. Suzette Grimes packed up Medora and the boys and took them off to New Orleans. Now 35, Sam was bankrupt, casting about for a way to earn a living. In the California gold fever sweeping the nation, he saw his opportunity. He joined the, gold, the 49ers rushing west, set up shop on the San Francisco waterfront, plowed his profits into the town's booming real estate market, and made a quarter of a million dollars in just three months. Sam adopted a much more rugged look in San Francisco. This image is from the New York Public Library. This new fortune went up in smoke when fire destroyed all of Sam's wards, wharves and warehouses. With creditors hounding him once again, he became a ferry operator in the California wilderness. He got caught up in schemes of American and French adventurers in Mexico. He sailed for France, then Nicaragua and Costa Rica on mysterious missions and bobbed up in New York, a wealthy man, again. Sam plunged right back into speculating on Wall Street and, surprise, his funds soon dwindled and with them what was left of Medora's affection. This time, Sam finagled a berth on a diplomatic mission to Paraguay and managed to convince both the American delegation and the Paraguayan president that he was responsible for the happy resolution of all issues. Sam sailed home with silver utensils for making mate in his trunk and in his pocket a secret agreement sealed with a thousand pound sterling to lobby in Washington on Paraguay's behalf. When he landed in May 1859, Sam headed to Washington to begin a new career. When Sam arrived in Washington in 1859, the original squat dome of the Capitol had been removed to make way for the better proportioned dome we know today. And you can see construction underway in this photo, courtesy of the architect of the Capitol. Sam wrote Julia that the nation's capital was a tinderbox. Washington sat squarely on the sectional fault line between north and south as the nation threatened to split in two. At public events, only a thin veneer of civility remained. And at private dinner parties, hostesses found it difficult to honor the rules of precedence and keep political enemies apart. Now, Sam was a Democrat. He believed in gradual emancipation and compensation for slave owners. He had many friends and family members in the South, but there was no question that Sam would remain loyal to the Union. He put his house on F Street at the disposal of his friends, the new friend, the new Secretary of State, William Henry Seward. There, his dinners, which had already begun to be noticed, provided the perfect cover for Northerners and Southerners who needed neutral ground on which to meet. Sam traveled through the Confederacy in the early days of the war with his old friend, British journalist, William Howard Russell secretly sending back letters to Seward for which he surely would have been hanged or shot if discovered. When in New York, Sam checked into the New York Hotel, a southern stronghold, and from there he sent letters full of all the gossip about the South and from the South that he could glean to Seward's desk. By the time the war was over, Sam's purse was thin, and he wrote to Julia, all my bank accounts are overdrawn. I have to go back to Washington to get some money. Now, Sam's timing was perfect. A new era was dawning, and a combination of old and new forces guaranteed that a man with Sam's unusual skills could indeed get some money in post-war Washington. Just how Sam went about spinning charm into gold is what I'd like to focus on now. Representatives of a host of reform groups were flocking to Washington, hoping to channel the newly concentrated powers there toward the betterment of society. If the federal government could abolish slavery, surely it could right other wrongs. Spokesmen for the poor and the sick, for criminals, for temperance and education, for civil service reform, for the abolition of capital punishment, for civil rights for Negroes, for justice for American Indians, for votes for women and for fair treatment of labor, converged on the Capitol to plead their cases before the new agencies, committees, and departments. The potential to make men millionaires by exploiting the lucrative new areas coming under the federal government's purview was the bait that lured a more cynical crowd to the Capitol. The war had schooled them as well. Conditions were ripe to spawn a ruthless era in which special interests, spoilsmen, and the corruption which seemed to ooze out of the doors of every government office. In fact, there wasn't anything new about the elements that gave rise to these unseemly years. All had existed before the war, 
But the confluence of so many factors encouraging corruption, the scale and audacity of the ensuing scandals, these were new. The coals were hot and ready for an unprecedented feeding frenzy in Washington, the Great Barbecue. The most sought after dishes at the feast were railroad charters and land, but eager new arrivals eyed tariff schedules and patent rights hungrily too. Others coveted mail routes, mining and timber rights, Indian trading posts and military contracts for everything from boots to beef. And one of these gentlemen, of course, was Sam. He was just as hungry as the others for fortune. And he had friends in high places, savoir faire, a trove of anecdotes and recipes, and his talents for diplomacy, all of which augured well for success. Sam's entree into the Johnson administration was Secretary of the Treasury Hugh McCullough, who faced a colossal task of financial reconstruction. Convincing Congress to support his plan would not, McCullough knew, be easy. One of those to whom he turned for help was Sam who could both talk the talk of finance and, more importantly, bring together men of opposing views to talk over their differences. And Sam was happy to oblige. From new headquarters on East Street, Sam set out to win a victory for McCullough via cookery, with the Treasury paying the bill. Sam was delighted when reporters placed the cost of his efforts for the Secretary of the Treasury at $12,000. Soon, the key senators and representatives on both sides of the currency debate were sitting down to dinner at Sam's table. Although McCullough was disappointed when he didn't get all he wanted, he was not disappointed in Sam, who claimed credit for the partial victory. Thanks to his work for McCullough and a string of successes with other clients, Sam's star was rising. To Julia, he boasted that he was a sort of Figaro. Tutti mi ciendono, tutti mi vogliono. Everyone calls me, everyone wants me. But what exactly did they want from Sam? And what did he do for those who called his name? In a letter to New York millionaire Samuel Barlow, Sam's friend as well as one of his most important clients, about work he was doing for him in Washington, Sam wrote, it's taken me a week to corral my congressional elephants. I'm at length able to write you favorably touching all of your projects. I can get the furniture bill passed any day. But how did Sam corral those congressional elephants? Sam knew a new recipe for success when he tasted it. Tinkering with the ingredients that had showed promise before the war, Sam used dinners and diplomacy as his preferred means to his ends. When Sam told Julia that tutti mi vogliono, what most of them really wanted was a seat at one of his dinners. Sam's note to Barlow about the congressional elephants ended, call on me at the New York Hotel on Monday at 10 a.m. when you will find me at breakfast and I will unfold to you my plan de campagne. Sam's special plan de campagne often began with pâté de campagne and champagne with Barlow or another client footing the bill. When in New York, Sam favored Delmonico's, but here in Washington, he rotated his larger lobbying dinners for more than a dozen guests among Wormley's Hotel, the Metropolitan Club, and occasionally John Chamberlain's new club. When it came to special dinners for no more than seven or eight guests, only Welcher's restaurant on 15th Street near the Treasury Building, owned by Belgian John Welcher, would do. As he had done when lobbying for Paraguay before the war, Sam gave his most select dinners in the privacy of his own home. There he had a two-man staff, his chef and his loyal valet secretary, Irishman Jerry Valentine, a horse handicapper who was Sam's second set of eyes and ears around town. Sam's kitchen was his laboratory, in which he invented culinary rules, recipes, and rhymes. To roast spring chickens is to spoil them, just split them up the back and broil them. Whether in consultation with Welcher's chef or his own, Sam took great care in composing every meal, from his lobby dinners to the grand banquets he orchestrated. The menu was, after all, Sam declared, the plan of campaign dependent upon the numbers of the enemy who will be reduced to capitulation by the projected banquet. Each course must be exquisite but small. Sam Ward, wrote reporter Emily Briggs, managed that his guests should never be satiated. His oyster patties, like a little woman, were so perfect, though small, that the next course would be anxiously awaited. Here's the menu for a banquet that Sam planned in the 1870s. It's written in his scrawling hand on the back of one of his business cards. While Sam chose the menu, he deferred to his clients, whether the Secretary of the Treasury, Barlow, European financiers, or American manufacturers when drawing up the guest lists. If their interests were financial, 
Sam would make sure that key members of the appropriate House and Senate committees received invitations. Mining and mineral rights, that would be another set of players. Which members were alone in Washington and lonely? Who was most persuasive and who most easily persuaded? Who was leaning one way and who another? Who might like to sit next to whom? All of these factors went into the mix when selecting guests. Once he determined his table mates, Sam concentrated on orchestrating the talk around the table. Good conversation was as essential as good food and wine, Sam believed, to the success of his evenings. He used stories from his variegated life like condiments at his table. He could salt dinner conversations with all sorts of tales. Nothing was ever served on Sam Ward's table, claimed Emily Briggs, that was half as delicious as himself. The results of Sam's great care in composing and conducting his dinners? Ambrosial nights, gushed one guest. And as I noted when I began, another guest enthused that an evening at Sam's was the climax of civilization. But how did these delightful evenings serve, serve Sam's and more importantly, his clients' ends? Subtly, slowly, and congenially. And therein lies what set Sam apart as a lobbyist. Sam claimed that he never talked directly about a project over dinner. It was probably because of his excellent wines, but his guests also left with the impression that he never outright asked any of them for anything. <clears throat> While Sam probably never actually found his job quite this easy, one reporter claimed that Sam Ward never asked a man about a measure in which he was interested at his dinner table. But he treated his friends so well that they were always anxious to do something for him and usually ask as they were leaving how they could help. Sam brought guests together around his table and let a good dinner, good wine, good conversation, convince, educated, launch, educate, launch schemes or nip them in the bud, and overcome obstacles. Nudged by Sam's careful steering of the conversation, his guests, who were all chosen with a purpose, might find to their surprise that they had common interests or much to learn from each other. A client might find himself sitting next to a congressman who was wavering on an issue of importance to him, or have a chance to talk casually to a congressman away from his office. Now, dinners were not Sam's only means to his ends. He spent many of his days visiting members' offices on Capitol Hill and cabinet departments clustered around the White House. Then as now, access was critical to a lobbyist's success, and Sam enjoyed remarkable access to offices around town. These were men he had known since childhood, met at boarding school, met at Columbia, men who had danced with his sisters and whose sisters he had danced with, men who had dined at his table and he at theirs. Like some other lobbyists, Sam also traded in information, providing facts and figures to anyone he could buttonhole to bolster a client's case. Many commented on Sam's prodigious memory. With the facts he had stored away about mining or steam travel or rail rates, coupled with amusing anecdotes and nuggets from his trove of trivia, he could hold his listeners' attention while persuasively arguing for whatever measures he was being pushed, paid to push. Nowhere, not in contemporary newspaper accounts, obituaries, congressional testimony, or in Sam's own letters or those of his clients, was there any hint that Sam ever took a bribe, offered a bribe, engaged in blackmail, or used any other means to win his ends. And Sam was very proud of that. In 1875, Sam was called to testify before a congressional committee looking into the awarding of contracts to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. The hearings went badly for some, but not for Sam, whose defense of lobbying and candid explanation of his part in the affair actually spread his fame even further. After Sam told the committee a parable about pig's ears, this cartoon of Sam in the kitchen appeared in the New York Daily Graphic. Now this is not to say that Sam stood alone as a paragon of virtue and that all other lobbyists were corrupt. Among his fellow lobbyists at the Great Barbecue, some were blatant, some were gross, some would stoop very, very low to blackmail and bribe, but many were none of these things. It is to say that Sam stood out from the rest because while he used some of the methods, <clears throat> excuse me, in many a lobbyist bag of tricks, he alone employed entertaining so deftly and so often to win his ends. 
It's true that rich Philadelphians had wined and dined members of the early Congresses in the late 1700s in hopes of influencing their votes. Men like Samuel Colt had bought their share of food and drink for congressmen in the 1850s. But Sam enlisted the combination of delicious food, fine wine, and sparkling conversations in his lobbying efforts in a systematic and central way that set him apart. Sam's style of lobbying required patience and savoir faire to pull off. He often gave dinners seemingly for no reason at all, save to bring together interesting men and women for evenings of mutual enjoyment. But at these evenings, Sam cast seeds that might not bear fruit for several years. New friendships developed, old ones were cemented, and Sam's list of men upon whom he could drop in for a chat lengthened. These were the hallmarks of what reporters would call the social lobby. And by the late 1860s, Sam was written up in newspapers across the country as its king. This is a picture of Sam looking quite regal in a caricature by Spy from 1880. From that first secret agreement to lobby for Paraguay, the list of Sam's clients expanded to include insurance companies, telegraph companies, steamship lines, railroad lines, banking interests, mining interests, manufacturers, investors, and business and individuals with claims of all sorts. For all of them, Sam put his dinners, his knowledge of the bureaucracy, his friendships with key players of both parties, his divining of official preferences <clears throat> together to slide bills through Congress, sidetrack others, guide claims through government bureaus. By the late 1870s, when Sam was approaching 70 and had reigned over the lobby for more than a decade, he was slowing down. His dinners still sparkled, but his letters revealed that he was getting tired, and the deaths of his daughter and then his son-in-law leaving his 10 grandchildren orphaned, of his old friend Charles Sumner, and then his brother-in-law Samuel Gridley Howe had left him shaken. Although Julia and Sam's friends urged him to slow down, the truth was that he couldn't retire. Sam was famous, but he was not rich. He lived well, very well indeed, but on other men's money. Of personal savings, Sam had none. He worked hard, but when it came to being provident, Sam was the grasshopper, fiddling, or as his case, spending money on presents for family and friends, while the more sober ants of the lobby amassed small fortunes. And then, just as it had many times before, Sam's fortune changed dramatically. In 1878, out of the blue, a very, very wealthy Californian, James Keene, showed up on the East Coast to return a favor. He had been a teenager, barely off the boat from Ireland in the California gold fields when Sam had found him down on his luck and desperately ill in the 1850s. Sam had nursed him back to health, and Keene never forgot his kindness. He had been manipulating a block of railroad stock with Sam in mind, and he felt the time had come to reward his good Sam Ayrton with the profits, nearly $750,000. With this dramatic change in his circumstances, Washington would see less of Sam. Although he was a frequent visitor, host, and guest in the Capitol, the king of the lobby was abdicating his crown, pulling up stakes, and decamping for New York 20 years after he first blew into town. <coughs> Excuse me. Now in the chips, Sam had his stationery with the compass pointing to, what else, Southwest SW, embossed in gold rather than the less expensive royal purple you see here in this 1872 letter to Thomas Bayard, my dear Don Tomas, from the Bayard collection here at the library. With money to spend, Sam's gift giving took on staggering dimensions. He had always sent casks of olive oil, bottles of Tabasco sauce, baskets of peaches to family and friends and strangers he met on the street. But now, for his sister Annie, Sam paid off the mortgage on the California ranch that she loved. For Julia, a widow who was struggling financially, there was a house as well. In 1880, Sam bought her a handsome townhouse on Beacon Street in Boston. There were bookcases for one niece, a pearl necklace for another, a sapphire pendant for another. There were boxes of cigars, crates of books, wheels of cheese, sacks of coffee for friends, and bottles of wine for everyone. Sam wrote Julia explicit instructions for handling the wine, champagne, claret, and sherry he was sending her in 1881. 
In the summer of 1880, Sam's letters were filled with enthusiastic reports about a grand money-making scheme. He was backing two developers, he'd only recently met them, but he was sure they were trustworthy, who were pushing a grand resort by the ocean in Long Beach on Long Island. You can probably guess where this was going. Within a year, to no one's surprise but Sam's, the project was requiring more and more cash while little seemed to be getting built. By the fall of 1882, Sam was in way over his head. When he finally admitted his situation to friends, they found that not only was his fortune gone, but he had foolishly signed papers, making him liable for millions more. When he had hit bottom in 1849, Sam had bid adieu to New York and sailed west to California. This time, he slunk out of town by catching a ship bound for England, trying to throw creditors off his scent. A niece recalled the consternation Sam's goodbye letter caused his mother and aunts as it sank in that Sam was on the lam again. The sitters, sisters envisioned brother Sam leading a quiet, chastened life in exile, harboring his few remaining resources. But instead, Sam bobbed up in London unrepentant and was straightaway entertained by everyone who was anyone. Soon he was writing jaunty letters back to Julia, who received them sourly, telling of weekends at country houses, a day at Ascot, chatting with the Prince of Wales. Sam did take time out to have this photo taken in London in 1883. The photo is still in family hands. Late in 1883, Sam moved on to Italy to join Louisa and her family. He climbed Mount Vesuvius. He swam endless laps far out from shore in Sorrento. In Naples, during Lent, he became violently ill, possibly from tainted seafood. And on the morning of May 19, 1884, Sam dictated one last lighthearted letter and died. Within days of Sam's passing, obituaries appeared in more than a dozen newspapers in London and America. The Times of London, the London Saturday Review, the New York Tribune, New York Sun, New York Commercial Advertiser, New York World, New York Herald, plus newspapers in Washington, Boston, and Chicago ran stories with headlines that read, a famous lobbyist dead, Sam Ward exit. And from the National Police Gazette, Sam Ward's career, his adventures as a lobbyist, philosopher, speculator, and lover. The New York Times obituary filled two entire columns with more than 4,000 words. <clears throat> After mentioning his twinkling eyes, his great bald head, his well-cut suits, and his sapphire ring, most of the obituaries focused on several aspects of Sam's life. Sam as a genial host, Sam as friend to the world, and Sam as king of the lobby. What a puzzle was this universal favorite, concluded the Tribune's obituary whom the sternest moralist could not find it in his heart to dislike, and the boldest lobby agent could yet call his comrade, who lived by arts which nobody can respect, and adorned a questionable life with so much amiability, so much refinement, and so much good breeding. While the tribute tried without success to solve this puzzle, it did put its finger on Sam's most significant contribution to the lobby. It correctly concluded that Sam's greatest achievement was establishing himself in Washington at the head of a profession which, from the lowest depths of disrepute, he raised almost to the dignity of a gentlemanly business. He never resorted to bribery. He excelled rather in composing the enmities and cementing the rickety friendships which play so large a part in political affairs. And he tempted men not by the purse, but with banquets, graced by vivacious company and the conversation of wits and people of the world. Sam's recipes lived on for decades. For years, bar patrons ordered Sam Ward's, a drink Sam invented. It's cracked ice in a glass, a thin peel of lemon, and yellow chartreuse. <clears throat> the Boston Somerset Club, Lockover Restaurant, and Algonquin Club carried one of Sam's signature chicken dishes, chicken saute Sam Ward on their menus into this century, which would have pleased him. The social lobby that Sam perfected live on, lived on and lives still. In the 1990s, hearings into lobby activities confirmed that the social lobby was alive and well in Washington. So well, so important, and so effective, in fact, that dinners and entertaining were specifically singled out for special rules in the 1995 Lobbying Disclosure Act lobbying disclosure act that were tightened further in 2007. 
One can almost hear Sam sputter with indignation upon learning that neither members nor their aides can accept free meals from registered lobbyists. Despite this closer scrutiny, the social lobby endures. It endures in part because of loopholes. There's the toothpick rule. Food served on toothpicks rather than on plates does not constitute a meal. And the reception exception, which members may still attend events where at least 25 people who are not members of Congress are present. But the social lobby lives on primarily because, as Sam shrewdly recognized, when he arrived in Washington in 1859, bringing people together over good food, wine, and conversation remains a fruitful way to break down animosities, make a point, and conduct business. What was a surefire plan to Campania for Sam is often a successful strategy still. Whenever lobbyists and congressmen come together at social occasions, even though they are more circumscribed, Sam is there. That the continuing power of the social lobby is well understood is clear in this great Sylvia cartoon by Nicole Hollander from April 2009. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Quote, the woman who manages everything more smoothly than you has a handle on creating bipartisanship. A series of intimate dinner parties should do the trick. I've compiled a list of powerful Republicans and their favorite foods. I've invited Yo-Yo Ma, everybody loves him, not like Barbara Streisand. And at the end of the evening, each guest gets an adorable puppy. Nobody can resist a puppy. Soon Democrats and Republicans will be exchanging dog training tips. Sam almost certainly could slip into any well-appointed office at one of Washington's top public relations firms on K Street, and in his well-cut suit armed with statistics and his Blackberry, make the rounds on Capitol Hill by day, and dressed in a dinner jacket with his diamond studs and sapphire ring, host and lobby at receptions, dinners, and benefits by night. Sam would be happy to see that the social lobby while just one of many avenues leading to influence in Washington was still going strong, and that entertaining still provides one among many opportunities for communication in the Capitol. As Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., another keen observer of Washington, noted 100 years after Sam's death, exaggerating just a bit as Sam was wont to do, every close student of Washington knows half the essential business of government is transacted in the evening where the sternest purpose lurks under the highest frivolity. Sam's art was to guarantee that the men and women who enjoyed his ambrosial nights never focused on the purpose that lurked beneath his perfectly cooked poisson. Thank you. So, can I take questions? Time for questions, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned a, a, a great convergence of uh, public causes of, mm -hmm. um, in the post-war period, and you listed the long, uh, the great number of private interests that he represented in Washington. Did mm -hmm. he ever take an interest in advancing a communitarian or a public um, cause at all? No. And could you, uh, no. <laughs> could you elaborate a little on the nature of the, uh, the enmity between him and this Mr. Butler you mentioned earlier in your talk? Ben Butler. Um, Kathy, could you repeat the question? Just oh, quickly? sure. I'm sorry. Um, the question was, could I elaborate on the enmity between Sam and Ben Butler? Ben Butler was a senator from Massachusetts. He vacillated between being a Democrat, being a Republican. He's well known, probably most well known, for uh, debacles during the Civil War. Um, he was known as Spoons Butler. He was the military uh, administrator for New Orleans after it was um, captured by the Union. Uh, he issued, uh, I can't remember the name of the order, but it was that all Southern women who disrespected Union soldiers should be treated as prostitutes. There were rumors that he stole family silver. That's why he was called Spoons Butler. His picture was painted on the inside of chamber pots throughout the South. I've seen some of these in museums. That's not really why Sam didn't like him. He and Sam really hated one another, partly because of Butler's vacillation from being a Democrat to being a Republican. Uh, Sam was a supporter of Andrew Johnson, didn't feel that he should be impeached, and had aided that in every way he could, and Ben Butler was definitely counting on Johnson being impeached. Um, the two of them traded barbs uh, their entire lives. 
Uh, similar, speaking about his enmities and persons of trial and fair, you mentioned uh, uh, James Garfield, um, but I also wonder uh, if he had any encounters with uh, either um, Ulysses Grant or Twain. Um, what, what they were like. He was very good friends with James. Oh, could you? T could I talk about um, Sam's relationship with other figures in the period, um, Grant and Twain? And Garfield. Garfield was one of his best friends. The two of them uh, loved the classics. Sam always had a copy of Homer in his pocket. And he and Garfield were drawn together by their love of the classics. Garfield had been a classics professor at Hiram College, I think, in Ohio. Um, Garfield also had a family back in Ohio, Lucretia and their children. And he was in Washington, and he was lonely. And he's one of Sam's most frequent dinner guests. In his diary, he recounts eating dinner at Sam's three and four times a week sometimes. He was also a very prominent member of important House committees. So I mean, he's not naive. He knows why um, he's invited to dinner when certain people are going to be the guest. But he's, he's OK with that. Uh, so they were very good friends. Sam had very little regard for Grant. Um, he didn't like uh, radical Republicans. He disagreed with the way Reconstruction was being conducted in the South. And he really didn't like the scandals that were just swamping the White House in Grant's second administration. It really seemed to the nation that this union that had been redeemed by the deaths of 600,000 soldiers was falling apart and that corruption was going to overcome uh, the recently redeemed union. So he blamed a lot of that on Grant. I don't think he thought Grant was personally corrupt but he blamed him for having very corrupt people around him. And I don't really have any evidence um, of his connection with Twain. Certainly they were in town at the same time. <coughs> if you haven't read Mark Twain's The Gilded Age, it is the most wonderful novel, political novel about Washington. And it's just vicious in its characterization of lobbyists. And the first edition had wonderful caricatures. Um, and there's one. Um, tally of how much it costs to get a bill through Congress. And so there are pictures of congressmen and senators and how much it costs to buy them underneath. It's, it's wonderful, as is Henry Adams' Democracy. I highly recommend them. They're great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I realize that you focus on the primarily male-dominated uh, world of the lobbyists in the late 19th century. But uh, in your book, you increasingly mention that there were also women lobbyists, even at that time. Mm -hmm. I wish there were. Um, the question is about women lobbyists in this period. Uh, there were definitely women lobbying. They were known as lobby S's, which is a really hard <laughs> word to get your uh, mouth around. But lobby S's were definitely on the scene. They're mentioned quarts of ink are spilled by reporters describing lobby S's. Um, we know that there were real live women who were lobbying for their own claims. These were known to many reporters as the poor things. These were Civil War widows, um, daughters orphaned by the war, daughters who were the only child left of a family whose farm had been taken by the war or lost livestock. And they would come to Washington themselves, and they would sit outside members' offices and try to get a moment of their time. They were rarely successful, and they would often spend what few resources they had left to do this. There were other women, sort of a middle tier of lobbyists, who would come as claims agents. They would often be hired by male lobbyists to present the case. Mark Twain says, um, talks about why a woman lobbyist is so successful. I think he says you can't, you can't brush them off like you can a man. There's there's a great line about why he thinks they were successful. And many times they were. They would plead a case and they would get a percentage of the claim once it was won. And then there's a third tier, which, as far as I know, really only exists in reporters' imaginations. They are the seductresses. One reporter calls them luscious melting peaches um, <clears throat> that tempt men to their doom. Uh, they're always, in the descriptions, very, very beautiful, beautifully dressed, wonderful jewels. Um, 
and they meet with men privately and use their feminine wiles to get what they want. These are talked about over and over again in reporters' uh, r accounts from Washington, but I really think this was a fear rather than a genuine something that happened frequently. Um, there is one woman, she's the wife of Attorney General George Williams, uh, who, about whom scandalous things were written, uh, things that I can't even repeat in letters here at the Library of Congress. Um, she does seem to have lobbied for her husband, uh, taken favors, uh, taken money, taken presents, uh, to push things before the Justice Department. Um, but she's the only person with a real name that I can identify. Um, and I can't find any lobbyists who left any kind of a written record. Where does the term lobby, lobbyist come from? Um, it's, it's very old in the United States. It's used as early as the early 1820s. Um, and there, there's one legend that it comes from the lobbies of the Willard Hotel. It exists far further back in American history than that. Um, it's a term that's used in England before it's used here. Um, but you find it as early as the 1820s. And it's, I mean, lobbying is as old as the government. From the minute the government opened, uh, there were individuals pressing for claims, um, asking for compensation, looking for pensions for the Revolutionary War Service. Um, it's protected by the First Amendment. Um, and that's something that a lot of people don't understand. So in the 1870s, when reporters are calling for the abolition of the lobby, um, hello, <laughs> you know, you, you just can't do that. And to lobby for the abolition of the lobby is, is an interesting um, exercise that was pointed out by many advocates for lobbying. And Sam was one of them. He gave an impassioned uh, testimony before the House Ways and Means Committee on the importance of the lobby and its, its regard in London that this, there were lobby agents that had a certain time and a place to lobby before members of parliament. So, so it's very old. Um, if you look at different political dictionaries, you find a different dictionary, a different definition in each one, but it seems as though it's older, it's, it's used in England before it's used here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that women were at some of his dinners. Was that standard? And did the men, women withdraw and men were in politics? Or how well, Sam had two kinds of dinners. He had one kind of dinner that really had a, a targeted purpose. If there was a bill before the Finance Committee or the Ways and Means Committee, and one of Sam's clients wanted the vote to go a certain way, he would, there's wonderful correspondence between Sam and his client Barlow. Barlow writes and says, it's the most candid letter writing about lobbying I've ever seen. Barlow will write and say, I want this vote passed. And Sam will write back and say, okay, it's gonna cost you. I'm proposing four dinners at $500 each. And here are the people I'm suggesting, but who do you want me to have? Those dinners were pretty much all male and um, more purposeful. But he often, often had dinners where he would just invite people he think, thought would be congenial. The Dan lots of ministers, foreign ministers and their American-born wives, um, members of Congress that he knew um, from different aspects of his life. They were really more cultivating dinners. Uh, women would be present. I don't have any evidence that they withdrew while the men smoked cigars, whether or not it was to talk business. Um, and Sam was very respectful of women's opinions at these dinners. Everybody who had dinner at din Sam's wrote home about them, and that's, that's one of the reasons you, we know so much about these dinners. And they would talk about, you know, Sam listened to me, Mr. Ward um, asked me about my opinion of this, um, and we, it didn't go unnoticed. All the women who wrote home mentioned this. Are you signaling uh, I me? I think that's I'm oh. signaling you. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please thank join you. me in thanking Kathy. Thank you. Really a pleasure to have your knowledge and your ex 
actual research experience explained to us so well, and you really have a contemporary look at a historical look at a contemporary situation, which everyone in the audience has enjoyed. Uh, Kathy is going to sit here to sign books. There are books for sale just outside the door. Uh, they're on sale at the Library of Congress discount. I encourage you to buy them and come back in and continue the conversation and get the book signed. But let's conclude one more time with a, with a thank you to Kathy. Thank you. Hey, there you are. Thank you. thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.